today. I'm glad you're here in God's house. It's also our house because uh, the greater place where God dwells is not inside this building. It's where? In us. It's inside of our hearts. So when you came into this place, God came and uh, he is here, you're here, and that's a good combination because we believe that God's going to do some good things here today. If you're here for the first time, we want to welcome you. Uh, you can be a visitor one time after that. You're part of the family, whether you like it or not, if you come back. And so if you're here for the first time, what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, bring the word. I teach first, and then we have a 15-minute break after the teaching. At that time, we receive offering. And then we just connect. We fellowship a little bit because we believe it's an important thing for us to connect together and to fellowship. It's an important part. So much, in fact, that we give 15 minutes of our service to that. During that time, I go back here in this corner. I spent a lot of time there as a kid, so it's a natural place to go. I go back here in this corner. It's called the guest lounge. And what I would like for you to do if you've never been here before or... If you've been here before but never had a chance to connect with me, I would love to get to meet you and just say hello to you. I'll be back there. Uh, we're not trying to sell you anything at all. I just really want to hear uh, your story, how you came to Open Door, just get a chance to meet you. So that's over here in the guest lounge. If you're interested in three things, baptism, joining our church, or becoming part of one of our small groups, over here in the left, my left-hand side in that corner is the members' lounge. Someone will be there. In fact, Joel and Diane Cushing, who are over here to my left, will be in that space there, and they can get you all of that information if you're interested. This morning, um, I'm joined up here with our illustrious worship leader, Mike Salvatore. And I asked Mike this morning when I got here, uh, Mike, let's start the day out with just a simple worship chorus where everyone can just worship the Lord for a minute before we teach and get started. So I want you to do that. Would everybody stand up and just welcome the presence of the Lord and honor the Lord before we get into his word, and let's worship him for a moment. My heart will sing No other name Jesus, Jesus, sing with me, my heart. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. I'm running to your arms. And oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your embrace, light of the Sing your love never fails. And your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Aren't you glad about that? Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. Sing that again, your love. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. Let's sing, run to his arms one more time. And oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. 
God, we just give you glory and look to you today and to begin this gathering focused on you, Lord, because we believe you are the answer, not a human being, not just, just the things we focus on around us, but Lord, ultimately you, the answer for our families, for our own lives and troubles and inconsistencies, for our nation and the nations of the earth. Lord God, we glorify you today. We focus on you. We draw our attention today. Unlike the other six days, today, Lord, it's you. We honor you, we praise you, and we bless your name. You're certainly worthy and more so. And today, we make this a worship service and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody, before you sit down, just clap your hands and give God praise today. Give him praise. Give him a good praise offering. Look up to the screen and let's say this together. I am blessed. I'm blessed going in and blessed going out. I am blessed in the bowl and blessed in the field. I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the country. My family is blessed and my home is blessed. Everything I put my hand to is blessed. Everywhere I put my foot down is blessed. Those that bless me are blessed and I am a blessing. Praise God one more time. And now before you sit down, would you turn around in a 360 degree circle and welcome everyone that's standing near you. Say hello to them. If you don't know their name, go ahead and politely ask their name and introduce yourself to them and let them know that we're glad they're worshiping with us today. If you're watching online, I want to thank you for being a part of this service today. And while we greet one another here, I want to greet you. If you're watching live, we have people who can chat on Facebook. You can go to our Facebook, Ohio is the address. Go to Facebook, Ohio, and you can chat with us there. Leave a comment if you want. If you're watching one of our archives, not on Sunday morning at 10 Eastern, we, uh, you can go to the Facebook page, obviously, but we won't have anyone there live to chat with you. But we welcome you, and thank you for being a part of this service today. When you came in today, at the registration tables, we always have the sermon notes. Be sure and pick those up. You'll notice that they are on hold paper. Those holes have been punched there for a reason because in our small discipleship groups we call D12, uh, we give out these notebooks. So if you are part of a D12 group, you should have been given one of these notebooks. If you don't have one, get one from your D12 leader and bring them, bring them to Sunday morning. We're clipping our notes in there during this particular series. Look up to the screen. We'll get started. D12 is just simply an acronym for discipling 12. So we believe that God has asked us to disciple people. That's all, all, ultimately what the purpose of the church is. We do it many ways, and one of the ways we do it is in meeting in groups like Jesus did with 3 to 12 people. Over the next five months, we're going to be working on what you see here on the screen. This is actually the model that we use to disciple people. We believe that we need to disciple people holistically. That means that we disciple people in these particular five areas. Those things eternal, which is you know, your eternal soul and would include discipling people in prayer and Bible study and what we might say is the more traditional means and mode and purpose of discipleship. But then we also believe that we need to disciple people in their families, disciple young marriages, disciple uh, young parents, and be able to tap into people who have been married for many years, been able to raise their children. But then also occupational. You don't always hear that in church, but we believe the Bible teaches that it is an honorable thing to have an occupation, a trade, a skill, and to use those skills in the marketplace to serve people and to glorify God. We also believe in discipling people physically. We need to get our bodies in as good a shape as we possibly can, nutrition, exercise. The reason is because God gave you one body and that's going to house you for the years that you live on earth. How many people are excited that you get a new one? 
when you get to heaven. I'm, I'm waiting on that one. But until then, we've got this one. And the Bible says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we need to disciple people. And we'll be talking about that even more in weeks to come. Then finally, relational. That there are significant relationships with friends and even family members. And it's through those relationships that God strengthens you. In fact, many times it's through those relationships that the devil tries to take you out. And how many times have we said something like, well, they were a good kid, but they fell in with the wrong crowd? How many people know the crowd can either take you forward or backward? Right? So we need to disciple people on their relationships. It's an important part of our life. Now, this is an extended series for five months, and if you look up to the screen, you'll see uh, the timing of it. In January, we talked about things eternal. This month in February, we're talking about things familial. In March, occupational. April will be physical. And then relational is when we're going to, we'll focus uh, on that during the month of May. Now, there is something that you're going to get in your D12 meeting uh, tonight, this afternoon. Some of you go go to them on different times, even during the week. But this is a new thing that we just put out this week. And for all the D12 leaders, we have these for you over in the members' lounge. So when you pick up your study guide for your disciples tonight, pick one of these up too. I'm excited about this, and uh, it's going to talk about the three main areas when you disciple people. In all five of those areas, there are three things you want to do. You uh, You want them to read Scripture and to know the Word of God on those five areas. You want them to learn how to pray in those five areas. And uh, you want to hold them accountable in those five areas. And so what we're doing is this. There's two special things I want to point out on this sheet. We're going to ask you to put 3 to 12 people that you begin praying for right away. So in other words, when you go to your D12 meeting and get this sheet, you're going to write down 3 to 12 people's names that you're going to start praying for right now. Because here's our hope. Our hope is come in June, everyone that's attending a D12 group will start discipling somebody else. It's not enough just to get discipled. You also have to learn how to make disciples. And so you attend a D12 group now, and in June we're going to release you that you can begin to minister to people and even start to form your own group. Right now you need to start praying for those people. And so you'll fill out 3 to 12 names. You'll have a few days, maybe even two or three weeks to think about this, to see who those people are you want to target. The second thing that I'm real excited about on this particular tool is the sample prayer down here at the bottom. Because, you know, when you pray for someone, maybe you don't know what to pray for. You know, you, you, you got a friend named Jim, and so you're going to pray for Jim. And how do you pray for Jim? You just say, well, God, bless Jim. Just help him. And then maybe you don't know what else to say. We, we can't assume that everyone really understands how to pray for someone effectively. And so what we've done here, we've, we've put a sample prayer. And uh, you can see that tonight whenever you go to your D12 meeting. Right now, here's the title of this particular teaching, Five Ingredients That Men Can Bring to the Home. It doesn't matter if you're single, uh, if you know, you're, you're married with kids or whatever. There are five things that every man in this room can bring into your family, into your environment, into your home. Five important things, in fact, that we're going to talk about. And uh, these are are things that uh, we're going to focus on men today. However, next week, which will be the final segment in this uh, series, that is Things Familial. Nikki is actually going to be speaking, teaching next week, uh, speaking to the ladies. But right now, I I want to talk primarily to the men. Although, ladies, I want you to listen because all five of these things you'll be doing too. But we're focusing on men. There are five things that men can bring into your home. All right, so let's get started. Five ingredients that men can bring into the home. The first one is this, understanding the people in your household. You know, that's one of the things that every team member or every coach has got to do. If you're going to coach, it doesn't matter if you're coaching a t-ball team or you're a high school team or a college team or a professional sports team. One of the things that a coach has got to do is learn the skills, the weaknesses, and the strengths of their players. You've got to be able to put people in the right position. And if you're a coach of a ball team, you know that you can't treat every athlete the same. There are some athletes that respond only when the pressure is on. There are some kids, you know, you just... 
and I remember playing sports. I remember watching my teammates and picking up on this. Some of my teammates would slough off unless the coach was in their face challenging their manhood, and then they would step it up to another level. I remember this one particular kid. He was a big old kid, and he was just soft, and he was, you know, just, just good mood all the time. And that doesn't really work if you're playing football. You know, you're just kind of in a good mood and jovial. Well, one day he got mad about something. He got so angry that he began to cry, and he became like the Incredible Hulk. But, you know, you can't coach every kid that way. There are other kids that when, when you criticize them, it tears them down instantly. They can't respond to that. In fact, the opposite may be true with this person is that you have to encourage them. You have to build them up. You have to complement their strengths. And it's in complementing their strengths that they'll work on their weaknesses. But other people are not that way. Some people I've noticed that whenever they get complimented, then they just unplug and they act like it's time to rest. And so it's almost like you can't eat, truly compliment them. You've got to give them a compliment, but then you always have to challenge their weaknesses. Your home is the same way. One of the things that men need to bring into the home is to understand the people in your household. It's a challenge, but you got, well, it may be impossible, but you got to try to understand your wife. Men, help me. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. You know, there, there's some, some things I was reading on the Internet. Someone said one time marriage is made in heaven, and the husband said, yeah, and so is thunder and lightning. <laughs> if it weren't for marriage, most men would go through life thinking they had no faults. I t- <laughs> this is the honest truth. I talked to someone that got married when they were about 30 years old, and they said this in all seriousness. They said, you know, it's really strange, but I didn't have bad breath until I got married. Somebody once, once said, any married man should forget his mistakes because there's no reason for two people to remember the same thing. <laughs> and you know your marriage is in trouble if your wife says, you're only interested in one thing, and you can't remember what that is. <laughs> You've got to take time to know your wife. You've got to take time to know your kids. And men, you can bring the type of coaching element, if you will, into your home that's needed. But you've got to take time to understand these people. One of the things that men don't always do well is relationships. Uh, We do other things well, but relationships sometimes are not the the, the easiest thing uh, that men are called upon to do. But the fact is that we've got to bring into our homes the type of understanding that we actively engage with the people in our home. If you look down at your notes... You'll see 1 Peter 3, 7. It's on the screen now. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. It says, husbands, dwell with them with understanding. Is it a challenge? Certainly. But we are called upon to bring understanding. There are three things you can see on your notes. Make what is important to other people important to you. You know, if you, if you got a little girl and, and she wants to have a, a tea party, sit down and have a tea party with that little girl. If your boy wants to play with blocks or army men, play with those blocks or army men. Make what is important to your children. Make what is important to your wife important to you. Make time to really get to know each other. I know that time is valuable. I know that time is rare. But we have to be willing to invest time. There's no way around it. There's no substitute for it. And finally, make it a point to really listen to each other. To truly understand means that we're going to listen. Up at the screen, you can see James chapter 1, verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to speak. To wrath. Let's say that together. Everybody quote this together. Ready? So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And so first of all, men can bring understanding into the home. Here's the second thing. Making and keeping commitments. One of the most detrimental things, men, that we do in the home is that we'll say, yeah, I'll do that, and then we never do it. 
And, you know, doing something for someone is kind of a man's love language. That's, that's part of, of how we express our love for someone. Ladies, you need to understand that. When, in fact, even working a job that a man hates. A man will go to a job every morning at 7 a.m., and he hates his job. And he will work that job for 40 years. And that is his way of saying, I love you. We're going to keep our home. We're going to make our mortgage payment. We're going to pay the utilities. We're going to make the car payment. We're going to help send these kids to school. That's his love language. And we, you know, ladies, it's, it's helpful for you when you recognize our love language. But guys, listen to me. It also says statements, if that is in fact your love language, doing something, when you promise that you're going to put the trim, the baseboard, in the room that you built 18 years ago. Or you got to put the receptacle cover on that light switch in the room that you painted four years ago. Unfinished projects. We've got to keep our commitments. What we're saying is we say that we're going to do it. We need to follow through with it. It's better not to make a promise than to make one and not fulfill it. And one of the things, men, that we can bring into our home, we need to, you know, guys, we need to quit complaining about what our wife does or doesn't do or what our kids, you know, do. Because the fact is, you can't control your wife, you can't even control your kids, but you can control yourself. And so when we seek to understand everyone in the home, as I said in point number one, the second thing now, making and keeping commitments we can control. We need to follow through to do what we said we were going to do. It says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses Three, I think, and this would include verse 4 as well. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. We've got to remember our marriage vows. Sometimes Nikki and I, when we've done marriage counseling, we've just sat people down and we've gone over the marriage vows, especially the ones that I normally use. The, this is you know, what they've said to each other when they make their vows to one another to love and to cherish for better for worse for richer for poorer in sickness and in health to love and to cherish till death do us part and uh, it's very effective when you look back at those wedding vows in fact I would suggest that everyone here that got married try to find those wedding vows or something like it and occasionally on your anniversary maybe, maybe even more times than just once a year Speak those marriage vows and understand what you said you would do when you made those vows. It's never too late. You say, well, I broke them or she broke them. You know what? Today's a new day. You can't do anything about your past, but you can do something about your future. You do something about your future by deciding today that you can change. I heard these two little boys one time. One little boy looked over the other one and said, well, how many wives should a man have? And the other little boy said, well, that preacher said you need 16. The little boy said, 16 wives? Yeah, that's what the preacher said. Four better, four worse, four richer, and four poorer. <laughs> I'm here all week. Number three, give honor and respect to others. This is what men can bring into the home. Give honor and and respect to others. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. What men can bring into the home is to give honor and respect to others. And I, I occasionally I'll hear men say who, you know, really fall back on those marriage vows or fall back on a few little scriptures we like to take out where, you know, wives are called to honor and respect and obey and, and all of that. I mean, all those things that the women love, right? And men will try to use that as leverage to say, you know, you need to treat me this way or you need to treat me that way. But here's what men don't understand who say that, is that the Bible has called us men to do that first. And what a woman does is respond to what you've already put on the table. You lay yourself out on the table, you give your all, you give your love, you honor and respect the people of your household. And I dare say that most women in this room would love to give their, themselves back to somebody like that. You know, I'm looking back there at Ben and Heidi. Ben and Heidi, raise your hand. How long have you been married now? Two months. Woo-hoo. 
Yeah, so, you know, last week I said one of the things that men and women ought to do is to share household chores, right? Didn't I say that? They ought to share household chores. So Ben gave me a text and said, now, Pastor, you said last week that we need to share household chores, and I've told Heidi three times to take out the trash, and she hasn't done it. Mm Mm-hmm. That'll teach you to text your pastor. (laughs) Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. What's it mean to honor and respect others? Look down at your notes. Here are just a few bullet points. Number one, we can honor and respect other people's achievements. Dad, there's nothing better than you can do for your wife, but especially your kids, is when they do anything good, you're, you're right there on them. Good job, son. Because I can tell you, both boys and girls live for dad's affirmation. And most of the counseling that I've done with people over the 30 years or so that that I've, I've been leading people and been in ministry, I can tell you that most of the time when people have real issues, it's because somewhere they never felt like they got dad's affirmation. Little girls and little boys. Little boys want to line up trucks and then call dad in to to look at them. What do they want? They just want dad to to affirm them and say, boy, that looks good. A little girl dresses up, and what's her greatest desire? She wants dad to say, you are so beautiful. Come over here and just wrap his arms around her. And you know, it doesn't matter how old you get. You still want dad to affirm you. You still want dad to say, that's a good job. You look beautiful. You did it. Awesome. Awesome. See, I, I grew up in, in an environment sometimes in, here in southern Ohio, and, you know, our culture is this hillbilly slash Midwest kind of slash mountaineer slash, <laughs> you know, we're just, we don't know what we are. We're here in Chillicothe. We're somewhere between the Midwest and Appalachia. And I remember growing up, and my, my parents, my, my dad and, and, and then his family, almost had this philosophy that you should never compliment people because they'll get proud and arrogant. And you know what? When you compliment people, you know, it would be said, well, don't compliment them, they'll get a big head. And so compliments were withheld many times because you didn't want to make someone proud and arrogant. But here's the fact. People who are proud and arrogant are trying to cover up for their insecurities. And they're covering up for their insecurities because somewhere they did not get affirmed, they did not get complimented, and so to overcompensate their sense of inadequacy, to overcompensate their sense of insecurity, then they come across as bold and arrogant and what we used to call braggadocious. I thought that word was in the dictionary. I used to go around the country and talk about someone being braggadocious. Everybody just kind of looked at me. What does that mean? Do you know what that means? Right? So the fact is, we all need complimented. So how do we bring in this affirmation? Look down at your notes. To give honor and respect to others, we compliment other people's achievements. Number two, we honor and respect other people's privacy. Believe it or not, as you nurture your children, you have got to delicately navigate the balance between intruding into their life and then giving them too much space and navigate that balance because every year that they get older, that balance is going to change. In fact, month by month, that balance is going to change. You can honor and respect their privacy. You can honor and respect other people's opinions. Sometimes it's okay to let someone have another opinion that you don't necessarily agree with. And you know what? Sometimes it's okay to let them have an opinion and you don't have to change them. You may not agree with their position. You may not agree with their opinion. But sometimes it's okay to let someone have an opinion and then let them work through whether it's good or not good, if it's right or wrong, if it's biblical or not biblical. Let them have that opinion, but honor and respect that opinion to the degree that you'll let them have it, let them navigate through the way that they see their worldview without you having this desire or feeling the need. They got to think just like you. Dads, you can bring that into your home and develop an atmosphere where children can develop 
their own ideas and use their own creativity. And believe it or not, in the long run, when someone finds their own opinions, it's better than when you force yours on them. And finally, you can give honor and respect when you honor and respect other people's time. The whole world does not evolve around you. Honor and respect their time. Let's move on. Philippians 2.3 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Do you get that? In fact, let's quote that together. This is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Ready? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better better than himself. Wow, can you imagine being in a group of people or living in a home where that was really followed? Where you're teaching children to actually esteem other people. Not to esteem them better than you in the sense of, well, I'm so low and I'm such a nothing, but it means that you look at people and you respect and honor them. My dad used to say to me, you need to respect and honor every person because they know something you don't. When I first went to Bible college, you know, Dad did not have a college education. And so there are times he felt a little inferior and insecure around people that he actually preached with. Dad, you know, was, was quite popular in the, the circles that he preached with. And so a lot of times he would share the platform with Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so or so-and-so with a master's degree. They were professors at a university or whatever and had all these achievements. And Dad, you know, had a Waverly High School diploma. That's all. And so when I was in college, I remember him telling me a lot. He said, Mark, do not disrespect and dishonor any preacher that you hear preaching. They may not be eloquent. They may not even know how to read all the Scripture right. And there's going to be issues. But he said this, you'll learn something from everyone that ever preaches or teaches if you listen with a humble heart. And you know, that's the truth. You can learn from anybody. How many people have learned something from your kids? Mm-hmm. Parenting is your great education just as much as theirs. And so we honor and respect. Now look to the screen at number four. Number one was understanding the people in your home. Then number two is making and keeping commitments, guys. Here's the third thing we can bring into our home. Give honor and respect to others. And now number four, supply heavy doses of encouragement. Supply heavy doses of encouragement. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, look to the screen. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Edify there means to encourage, to build up. How do we encourage people? We can encourage them by smiling. We can encourage them by speaking encouraging words. We can encourage people by pointing out the positives. We can encourage people by giving thanks. We can give gifts. We can be thankful for them. But how many people know that you cannot give out enough encouragement? You know, as a a minister, I know there's a lot of things that I could do. I can, and I've done it. I mean, I, I can beat you up. And how many of you have been in a service where someone has used the Bible as a weapon? And not against the devil. I'm talking about against you. Because the Bible can beat you up, man. There's stuff in there that's, that just, wow, can make you feel terrible. And what I learned over the years is that for me, I always do better when I'm encouraged. I feel like I'm a better husband if I get encouragement. I'm a better father if I get encouragement. I preach better, teach better. I'm a better pastor if I get encouraged. Everything that I do, When someone recognizes what I've done and just says, good job, that always motivates me. And I would say most of the people in this room are the same way. We need to get encouraged. Okay? We need to get complimented. It reminds me when Bryce came to our house one day and asked for my daughter's hand in marriage. And... Went into a room. I said, it's good, Bryce. My first words were, Bryce, good women aren't cheap. (laughs) 
I said, my daughter's used to a good living, good life, good father, good mother, good family. And you're an artist. I said, how are you, how are you going to provide a home for my daughter? He said, God will provide. <laughs> okay, but how, how are you going to put food on the table? God will provide. Well, how are you going to get her a car? God will provide. All right, but how are you going to get her nice clothes? God will provide. How are you going to go on vacation? Well, God will provide. I said, okay. We walked out of the room. Nikki said, well, Mark, what did he say? I said, that boy thinks I'm God. (laughs) I'm talking about encouragement. (laughs) He just worships the ground I walk on. Number five, men can bring understanding to the people in your household. Men can make and keep commitments. Men, we've got to honor and respect others. Men have to supply heavy doses of encouragement. Finally, men have to ooh, ask for and offer forgiveness. Not easy. One of the most humbling things that you'll ever do is to admit that you were wrong. Remember Fonzie, the old happy days? He could never say, I'm wrong. It just couldn't, couldn't come out of his mouth. And you know what that is? That, again, is just a sign of someone who's very fragile and insecure. It takes a very secure person to be able to say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Now, you know, you can say, I'm wrong and I'm sorry, but really not mean it. Like, you just can say it with an attitude like, okay, fine, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Good, okay? That's called winning by losing. That's called victory by defeat. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about honestly giving forgiveness and asking forgiveness. In fact, I believe that so much of this kind of environment in families with mom and dad and kids, so much of this environment really is set by the Father. Because women, not not every woman, but generally speaking, women might have an easier time humbling themselves this way but men have fragile egos and it's not easy for us to humble ourselves and many times this is a, this is a humbling of yourself it's an asking of of forgiveness to say i'm sorry i was wrong but you've got to be able to bring that into your home you know there's times where it's even appropriate for you to ask your children to forgive you i've asked my kids to forgive me before i think twice but to say you know what i was wrong i shouldn't have said that Doing the wrong thing isn't always a bad thing. Doing the wrong thing can actually become a good thing when you acknowledge it and you ask forgiveness. You know, typically over the years I've prayed for my kids. I would pray for them, go to their bedrooms, you know, before they went to sleep and lay hands on them. In fact, the blessing that we say every Sunday, that came out of our home. I did that for years over Andrew and Alexandra and Austin. Lay hands on them and say, you're blessed. You're blessed going in and blessed going out. You're blessed in the bone, blessed in the face. I just said that over them for years. And I would pray for them, and then I'd put their hand on my forehead. And I'd say, now pray for me. And they'd pray for me. They got so used to doing that. In fact, when Austin was about a year and a half or maybe two and a half years old during Christmas, we took him to, to see Santa. And he sat on Santa's lap and looked up at Santa and then put his hand on his head and prayed for him. <laughs> Santa, Santa was like... I mean, it really just like, I don't know if the guy was an atheist and didn't appreciate the, the prayer or what, but Austin prayed for him. Oh, Santa was drunk. Oh, that's what... <laughs> well, he needed prayer. Asking for and offering forgiveness. That means that you learn to forgive. Don't, you know, don't, 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 don't go to bed mad. Don't stay mad for two or three days. Guys, get over it. Hello? Man up. I'm just going to talk to you as man, man up. If you're not talking to your wife, get over it. Talk to her. If you've got, you know, teenage children, the way that you deal with it is you just don't talk to them and ignore them. Grow up. Quit being a baby. Man up and be, in, be, be the adult in the room, Okay? Don't go to bed angry. Don't withhold forgiveness. Don't just do the silent treatment. Get over it. Learn to deal with people in this kind of way. 
There's been times where, as I said, I went to my kids and I said, you know, I shouldn't have said that. Maybe you blew up. I've done it. I've, I've done it, just lost my cool and said things I shouldn't have said and overreacted to situations. You calm down, you go back. You know, it's not an, an, an inappropriate to say, look, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Always ask them, will you forgive me? And they'll say yes. And if they say no, say, well, then I want you to work on it. I want, I want you to pray because I, I was wrong. And then when they get home from school, ask them again. But learn how to coach people in forgiveness because here's something that applies to everybody in this room for the rest of your life you're going to have to forgive people we live in a world you go to a church you live in a home where you're going to have to forgive people it just doesn't matter where you are or who you live with people in there will do things and say things that offend you and hurt you you're going to learn how to forgive these five things are incredibly powerful understanding the people in your household. Men, make and keep commitments. Give honor and respect to others. Supply heavy doses of encouragement and ask for and offer forgiveness. In Colossians 3.13, it says, Bear with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has complained against another, even as Christ forgave you, watch this, even as Christ forgave you. How many people know that God has to forgive you per near every day for something? And so just as Christ forgives you, forgive other people. I'm going to conclude with this. I'm going to read you a story. Okay? So you can put your Bibles down and put your notes down. I just want to read you a story. Her name was Mrs. Thompson. As she stood in front of her fifth grade class on the very first day of school, she told the children a lie. Like most of the teachers, she looked at her students and she said she loved them all the same. But that was impossible because there in the front row, slumped in his seat, was a little boy named uh, Teddy Stoddard. How many school teachers do we have? You know what I'm talking about. There's always one or two. Mrs. Thompson watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play well with other children, that his clothes were messy, and that he constantly needed a bath. And Teddy could be unpleasant. It got to the point where Mrs. Thompson would actually delight in marking his papers with a broad red pen, making bold X's, and then putting a big F at the top of the page. At the school where Mrs. Thompson taught, She was required to review each child's past records. She put Teddy's off until last. However, when she reviewed his file, she was in for a surprise. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, quote, Teddy is a bright child and ready to laugh. He does his work neatly and has good manners. He is a joy to be around. Then his second grade teacher wrote this, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he is troubled because his mother has terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. Then his third grade teacher wrote, his mother's death has been hard on Teddy. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't seem to show much interest and his home life will soon affect him if some stops are not taken. And then his fourth grade teacher the year before wrote this. Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends, and he sometimes sleeps in class. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem, and she was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when her students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful ribbons and bright paper, except for Teddy's. His present was clumsily wrapped in heavy brown paper that he got from a grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of perfume. This was the present that Teddy brought his teacher. But she stifled the children's laughter and she 
explained how pretty that bracelet was, putting it on and then dabbing some of the perfume on her face and wrist. Teddy Stoddard stayed after school that day just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, today you smelled just like my mom used to. After the children left, she cried for at least one hour. On that very day, she quit teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. Instead, she began teaching the children. Mrs. Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy. As she worked with him, his mind seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. And by the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the best students in the class. And despite her lie that she would love all the children the same, Teddy became the teacher's pet. A year later, she found a note under her door from Teddy telling her that she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. He then wrote he had finished high school, third in his class, and she was still the best teacher he ever had in his life. Four years later, she got another note from Teddy saying that while things had been tough at times, he had stayed in school, he had stuck with it, and he soon would graduate from college with high honors. He assured Mrs. Thompson she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Then four more years passed, and yet another came. This time, he explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go a little further. The letter explained that she was still the best and favorite teacher he ever had, but now his name was a little longer. The letter was signed Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. But it doesn't end there. There was yet another letter that spring. Teddy said he had met the girl that he was going to be married to. He explained that his father had died a couple years earlier, and he was wondering if Mrs. Thompson might agree to sit in the place at the wedding that was usually reserved for the mother of the groom. Of course, Mrs. Thompson did, and guess what? She wore the bracelet, the one that had a few rhinestones missing, and she made sure that she was wearing the perfume that Teddy remembered his mother wearing on their last Christmas together. They hugged each other and Dr. Stoddard whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, thank you, Mrs. Thompson, for believing in me. Thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a difference. Mrs. Thompson, with tears in her eyes, whispered back and she said, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how much, I didn't know how to teach until I met you. There is somebody in your life every day, maybe in your household, maybe at school, maybe at work, that if you would love them, believe in them, be Christ to them, seek to understand them, compliment them, and forgive them when they need it, you will make a lifelong difference in their life. It's time for us to be disciples of Jesus Christ for this world. Everyone stand and let me pray for you. God, we thank you for our morning this morning. We thank you, God, for a good warm building to come to and good family and friends to enjoy this time today together with. And thank you for our worship song that we had. Thank you for our ushers and servants, our teachers next door and the people who work hard to have a good experience for everyone that comes. I pray, God, that you will raise up good, strong disciples in this church. And as we focus on these men today, Lord, I pray for the young men in this front row who are, who are just starting making decisions in their life to the oldest gentlemen here and everyone in between that we would be the kind of man that I tried to describe today who seek to understand people who give encouragement who know how to forgive and be forgiven Lord help us to encourage people like the story of Mrs. Thompson did with Teddy and help us to make a difference in this world every day that we live in Jesus name Amen